what is happening. I'm just like, man, when you go live on different stuff and popping up and chatting with people and sharing stuff, you're like, did I stop to clean my face after I ate? It's a hectic time. It's, it's good though. It's nice to be able to share conversation and interact with people and share ideas and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a tough time for a lot of people, for a lot of us, and we're all human. So some days we're a little bit better than others. Um, but there's a few very, very foundational key things um, that we want to uh, do. Exercise. I don't know if you can tell, I've lost a couple pounds. We've been jogging. We did six kilometers today and seven and a half yesterday and five the day before that, a couple days before that. So that's been good. Yoga in the morning, right after, excuse me, right after yoga, hit the road, do a run, Erica and I, and then uh, some work and some learning and whatever we can do tonight. So I'm going to um, get together with a friend here in just a second. He's going to ask to join. Maybe after, we'll chat for a bit. I might have only 30 minutes, I'm not sure. Um, I'm doing some stuff with Fail Army. I don't know if you guys know those guys. Um, Fail Army, oh, they just uh, hit me up, so that is three, three, yep. I just am responding to them. Fail Army, um, I do breakdowns. Uh, with them on their stuff. If you go to at Fail Army, they have all these crazy fails and and uh, goofy things. People falling off skateboards and splitting their heads open, and usually not too. Usually, there's more humor than pain, uh, which is nice. Um, <laughs> that's a that's kind of a good thing in general. But I take some of their videos and I um, break them down, kind of analytically, and have a little fun with them. And uh, they've been sharing one a week. So I've got one coming out today of two construction workers uh, competing in something. So that's fun. But I got a call with them uh, after we hang out here. And then today at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. So that's 2 p.m. on the Pacific. And it's like nighttime in Europe. I will be on Fail Army's Instagram Live. I will be hanging out with uh, the peeps from there. And I'm bringing in a friend right now. This will be his podcast. We're going to say this is the, the JB podcast. Um, we're hosting it here on my page, but this is his podcast. How are you, man? How are you doing, bro? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Before we start hanging, tell, uh, tell the peeps about your podcast so they, uh, so they follow you. Uh, yeah, so basically I do the uh, JB podcast. I posted Robin on um, myself before previously, which was a really good episode. So go check that out. Um, I've spoke to many people in the UFC sort of world, such as Bass Rutten, Tito Ortiz, uh, yeah. Michelle Watson. I uh, also talked to people in the BJJ world. Um, my instructor over here, Paul Bridges, and uh, a woman who's won the world championships, uh, Cassidy Welch. So a wide yes. range of guests. I've had porn stars on and things like that as well. <laughs> you know, yeah, whoever art, I can talk to. Yeah, they're artists in their own right, right? Um, so let's call this the JB Podcast. So I'll, I'm going to let you run it. But uh, I just want to ask you first, how long have you trained jiu-jitsu? Uh, I started in November. So I'm basically new. <laughs> Fresh. Amazing. Yeah, that's great. It's, uh, it is the adventure of it is really amazing at all points, but at the beginning, there's a beauty in it. And, you know, just trying to figure out how to move your body and learn physically. And, and yeah, it's an, it's an amazing adventure. Yeah. I mean, um, I have to say, I think it's probably the best hobby I've ever decided to do. It's yeah, I know it's, it's true. <laughs> the blend it's of physical and mental and, and, uh, and challenging yourself and stuff for anybody watching or will watch this later. Uh, jiu-jitsu, I mean, right now it's tough to train jiu-jitsu, but you can go online and learn about it. You know, some of the greatest are doing online, you know, training and, and teaching however they can. I saw Matt Sarah teaching jiu-jitsu the other day on his Instagram. So it's out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my um, my instructors for my class, because obviously we're, we're still paying monthly to them, they're putting up um, online classes, and luckily two of them live together. Nice. Uh, it's Paul and, and his wife, Ali, and they're both black belts as well. Awesome. So they're kind of doing drills on each other and showing us single drills that we can yeah. do. Yeah. Mental. Yeah. 
No, it's great. I'm, tonight I'm going on with Julia Budd. She was Bellator um, a featherweight champion, uh, women's featherweight champion. She just lost that to Cyborg in a, in a really great fight. They do do at-home training every day, so I'm going to go on Bellator's Insta and then join their training tonight. So all that Smart, stuff is man. out there. Yeah, I mean, shit. Like, for a lot of people right now, just getting food and shelter and stuff is important. So we can't pretend that's not the sake. But if we're some of the, the lucky people who have those basic fundamental things, right now is the time we can learn a skill. And for some of us, it, it won't, won't necessarily be physical. We might learn to play a musical instrument or we might, you know, read a couple of key books that make us think differently. But we, we have, because the one thing we have right now for, again, not not everybody. Some people don't have the basic resources, and, and those are the ones we have to look out for. But if you do, the one thing you do have right now is time, and you've got to leverage time to learning and skill development or self-improvement so that when you leave this quarantine-type scenario, you bring something back for yourself, but also to bring back to the world. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the other perk is people are doing things on Instagram, which means it's free. So right. you can learn BJJ skills and stuff yeah. for free at the moment, you know, yeah. and, and practice them at home. Yeah, which whatever is that is. A blessing. For, for somebody. If somebody always, you know, if somebody's 43 years old and they're like, God, I wish I learned to play piano when I was a kid. Well, you might be home for 67 days. If you played piano twice a day for 20 minutes a day, you'd be shockingly good. 67 days from now. So that's something that, you know, again, it's, you don't want to push it so hard as an idea because it can forget that some people do not have time, do not have the luxury. Um, now, if you have kids at home too, you have to teach them, right? You have, mm. and, but you don't have to teach them the way that the world says you do. You don't have to do social studies and history and whatever. You can teach them about anything. You can teach them about anything, and it, that may be a challenge later, but we're in a world where the school structure as it is isn't necessarily making 18-year-olds that are ready for the real world. So right now, you can, you can put a little bit of that in, but it is a strange time. It's a scary time. It's a tough time for a lot of people, but if you have the time, you want to come out of this with something you didn't have when you came into it. Yeah, I agree, and I think um, sometimes you have to see, like, the blessing in the shit situation, you know? Like, you are having to home-study children, but with that comes that opportunity to teach them some things that they might not get in their natural curriculum, you know? Yeah, yeah, and that can be, that can be a non-school thing. It can be empathy, you know, or mindfulness, or, or the value of, of learning, or, you know, humor, <laughs> Like you mm. have the ability to, to do all of these things. It, it's a strange, it's a fucking strange time because people will mention right now and then they'll mention it in conjunction with like, you know, 1918, there was, I don't know, I can't remember if it was smallpox or which one there was. And, and they'll talk about, about that. Or I think it was the 1300s with the Black Plague. Um, and they'll make the reference, but there's no very little similarity other than the fact that we are, can all get sick because the, our ability to communicate instantly has changed everything. Not only can you turn on the news and why is everyone in their home right now? Because it's the right thing to do. You couldn't have got that information to people 60 years ago. It just wasn't possible. You know, when you took out newspaper ads. Oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, got you, yeah, got you, got you back. Now? Um, yeah, when, maybe you would try to take out newspaper ads in the world, but only a certain percentage of people saw that. Whereas now we can get everyone in our homes and then when we're in our homes, we can still communicate. The hardest part now, it's probably going to be psychological. Again, some people, it's the simplest things, food and safety. But for a fairly large percentage that have those things, which is a function of the world that, that we're lucky to live in, um, uh, Fear, anxiety, loneliness, you know, not interacting with people, being isolated, that's probably the biggest challenge. But when we can hang out like this, that challenge is mitigated too, right? And we can, in, instead of just like, oh, cool, we finally got to see somebody or hear another human voice, what if we can learn something? Or what if we can be inspired to think differently? I mean, so we're in, you know, considering the challenge of the moment, we're in a pretty good place that it happened to us in the year 2020 and not, you know, ni um, 1961, you know? Mm.
Oh, great. How have you been um, using your time sort of with all this going on? Like, what have you been doing with yourself? That was kind of one of the main things I wanted to touch on. So the big thing for me early, like right away, was that my wife and I were here and I, we haven't spent, you know, we got married eight years ago and, and we went on a honeymoon that lasted, I think, 11 days. And it was great. We went to Florida together and we were, and since then, there have been 15 and 20 day stretches where we've been together and with my job and traveling and commentating and analyzing and, and studying martial arts around the world. Uh, there's been 20 and 27 days where we've been in the same city. She, she travels a little, when she's traveled during that time, she's traveled sometimes for like 10 months at a time, different city every month. She's in musical theater. Um, and I, I've traveled for three to five days a few times a month and over the last few years it's been multiple times a month um the last year or so i'm probably away 16 of 30 days so right away we realized we'd be together and that that was a great thing we didn't ask for the world to be happening the way it is and it's scary for a lot of people but some there'll be something positive for many of us that will happen so we're like we're together let's take care of each other and right away we both kind of realized we need a structure like we need to have a structure um and we made simple rules. They weren't written down. They weren't outlined. They just kind of fell into place. We don't turn on the TV really before about 5 or 6 p.m. If there's happy hour, it's rare. And, uh, you know, it's a couple times a week. Um, and we started doing yoga every morning online. And we weren't, neither one of us was actively doing yoga at the time. And within a few days, we went from yoga at 10 a.m. immediately to yoga then running. And, you know, if I can... 11 days ago, she had never run three kilometers in her life. She's athletic because she's a performer. She's a singer, a dancer, actor, but, but she'd never run three kilometers in her life, she'll tell you. And we did seven and a half kilometers yesterday and six and a half today. Like we're running five, six, oh. seven kilometers. Um, we get home at noon. I still work for Bellator and I'm thrilled because I love them and it gives me a purpose. So I started doing Bellator, conversations with Bellator fighters every day. And those conversations were geared at what are you doing? How are you getting through this? What are you learning? You know, how are you staying sane? All geared at that because I'm curious. It's valuable for me, the, the chatter. But it's also valuable for the audience. And then now that's just continued, you know. So we get up, uh, yoga, run, work for five, six, seven hours, focused heavily on Bellator, as well as my own interests, analyzing, fighting, and I'm doing my YouTube channel every day and stuff. And then maybe another workout at night. So some days it's three even. And then um, get a good night's sleep. The priorities are exercise. Number one priority if you have your, your basics, your, your minimum, your food and safety. Then sleep, good sleep. And then um, good nutrition and seeing people and, and sharing good ideas. And so I'm very happy to say it's been three weeks since I came back from the Bellator show that got canceled. I got in the car and just drove eight and a half hours from Connecticut back to Canada. And then that was 21 days ago. And since then, like, I've been very, I can very proudly say I've been practicing what I preach, diet, exercise, food, positive, positivity, rest, and, uh, and communicating with a lot of people. Have you had uh, the pleasure of um, hosting or interviewing uh, Austin Banford? I did. As a matter of fact, I chatted with Austin on Saturday night of last week, Bellator re-ran Bellator, I forget, I think it's Bellator 225. It was a show with 14 finishes, 14 fights, 14 finishes. They rebroadcasted. Actually, hundreds of thousands of people watched it on Bellator YouTube. And I went up, I took over Bellator's Insta that night, and I cycled in fighters while their fight was on. I talked to them about the moments. So me and Austin yeah. Vanderford talked about his fight during his fight. Ann and um, Ricky Bandeas and Tyre, uh, Tyrell Fortune and a number of other guys. And uh, we chatted about their fights during it. Uh, Austin's, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was talking about how his wife is cracking him up and she's always dancing around half naked. And I'm like, dude, you're living the dream. Like you're married to your best friend. It's super hot. You're both uh, like all the same stuff. You're living in a nice house. Like you, you got no complaints, you know, and he didn't, mm. and he certainly didn't seem to. He's a really, really, really good guy. Good martial artist, uh, a smart guy. And, uh, and Paige is wonderful. She's a great little, little uh, combat sportsman, sportswoman, sportsman, whatever you want to say, martial artist and business person too. And she's cool. You know, I, I like them both.
Yeah. No, I, I follow Austin on, um, obviously, just on Instagram. And uh, yeah. he just seems down to earth, you know, genuine yeah. dude. Seems to just be loving life. Like, kind of that guy who's just like, how is this my life? You know, I'm fighting yeah. Bellator. I'm 14, 14 wins. I'm married to Paige. Like, I'm living yeah. in this fucking house. Like, really appreciative yeah. of all the things. And it, I think his vibe comes across like that. Just kind of yeah. just what I wanted to know your take on on speaking to him and whether you got that vibe from speaking to very him much. personally. Yeah, very much. He grew up in Austra uh, in um, Alaska. He grew up in Alaska, you know, wrestling and hope, you know, and dreaming of bigger and better things. And and he's done that. That's actually something I've been talking a lot about with these Bellator fighters. I talked to Daniel Weichel about that the other day. Like Daniel was in Germany. There was M MMA was, and you know, that particular, he, he likes, he is a combat athlete. Um, but MMA and the structure of it as a competitive sport uh, was low level in, in, in Germany. It didn't really exist. And now the guy is fighting in a, in a tournament for a million dollars, um, you know, and, uh, and he lives in a nice house with his family that's been paid for with his art and his athletic career. And so I like to ask those guys that, you know, when you were 16, is this what you imagine? Um, and I tend to, with no judgment, people can talk about anything they want when they get the gift of talking to somebody else, whether that person's a famous athlete or just a, a, a person that they meet online or somebody who, who requests to be in their Instagram live stream, you know, that they normally are only in with their friends. And somebody pops up, hey, it's like we get the chance to talk to people now. But when I talk to people that have, are doing great things, I want to talk about that, but the journey of that you know, about the dreams that they had and where are they now compared to that? And, and, you know, relative to what their hopes were, where are they? And a lot of the time, what you find from some of these guys is, and women is uh, they never even dared to dream to the point that they are. Um, and uh, in a lot of cases, people set goals, achieve them, and then have to set new goals. And sometimes you achieve those and then you set new ones. Uh, and that path I think is more it proves to be successful more often than just be like, I'm going to be the biggest rapper in the world, or I'm going to be the UFC champion when you're 16. That may not serve you as well as I want to be a professional performer. And then once you do, it's like, I want to be able to perform at this level. And then I want to like, and slowly set achievable bite-sized goals. That seems to work a lot better. And the ones who do that are the ones that are much more grateful because you also find that in that path, there's, um, there's a lot of things that just kind of good fortune happens. You know, if you're going to be a world champion of something or a hit rapper or like, you know, very successful or like have a beautiful family or these things, some of that is shit you did. And some of that is just some good luck that you had. You know, you, mm. you zigged when you could have zagged and you met the person that you fell in love with. And then, you know, and, and I mean, you, you or you got turned down for a job that you dreamed of and because of that good fortune you ended up finding another job like you know there's a lot of good fortune that has to happen if you're going to be sitting where we are right now living a pretty good life and being happy you i saw you made a post about about a soulmate are you with are you do you have a partner that's like you're tight with yeah yeah yeah, you, yeah 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 and so do i I mean, some of that is fucking luck. Like, what if you yeah. didn't meet? What if you didn't meet her? What if you I've didn't go to wherever? Well, yeah, I've had a few bad seeds. Of course, <laughs> experiences, but, though, you know. For sure, but but her specifically, and you specifically for her. The day you met, if your phone rang and something else had happened, or your job got canceled, or didn't get canceled, or a family member had suddenly got injured and you didn't meet. Every single thing that happened as a result of that did, wouldn't have happened. So there's a certain amount of good fortune. There's a certain amount of good luck. And when you set your goals appropriately, you see how chancy some of these things are. You're much more grateful. Because um, I ask people about feeling proud often. I'm always curious about that. And not in a judgmental way, because there are times where I, I feel proud of the things that I do. I'm like, wow, it's really cool. But usually it's actually gratefulness. 
usually you're actually just thankful, not really proud. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. You're more grateful when you realize that if you are successful or happy or, or you win something or you, you're in love or whatever these great things that we're all hoping for, you're much more grateful once you realize that some of it was your doing, but some of it was just fucking luck too. Oh, you, know? Hands, yeah. you know? I mean, that's, um, that's something I think as well that could, people could use this time for is setting those goals, you know, because mm -hmm. we're all guilty of it. You're in that manic lifestyle. Sometimes you're like, yeah, yeah. I want to, I want to be this and I want to achieve yeah. this. And you never necessarily write down how or the steps that you need to get there, you know, 100%. to be UFC. Yeah. To be UFC world champion. Well, how are you going to get there? Like, you need to yeah. get here, be here, work here, save this money, however you're going to do it. And I think yeah. people could use this time now maybe to plan and prepare their goals, what they're going to achieve in the next three to five to ten years and be like, okay, I'm working off this model now. Because, yeah, <clears throat> unfortunately, life doesn't work in the way of, you know, someone's going to knock on your door and be like, here you go. Here's, here's your golden ticket. You know, it's fucking pretty much... Yeah non-existent you know i've never known it to happen so if it has happened fair play yeah. to someone but i think they need yeah. people should use that time you know to to make some plans for sure for sure and like a lot of things we find as time goes on and you look at the depth or the truth of something if there's a lot of <laughs> conflicting native truths in anything so on one hand, people will say, set your goals high, because then if you don't quite reach them, you still progress really far. And that makes total sense. It really does. But on the other hand, if you set them too high and you don't break it down into bite-sized pieces of, along the way and recognize the beauty in each one of those bite-sized pieces, you won't start at all. You know, mm -hmm. and and I've, you see this a lot where people are like, and I've seen it, people are like, I will do this market but only if you can guarantee me it's going to be successful. It's like, we can't guarantee you that. Let's say you have a coffee company and you want to like sell your coffee at some, some market. And uh, it's like, well, we can't, um, we can't guarantee you it's going to be successful. They're like, well, then I don't want to do it. Yes, you do want to do it. Because, and you want to be prepared for the realities of failure. Anything you do will involve shitloads of failure, shitloads of setback. Over and over, you have to become you have to become not only comfortable with it, but you have to find like sort of almost a serenity in it. That you have to find it to be normal. Because once you find it normal, Simon just said, "Can't cook a meal without lots of small ingredients." I love an I love a good analogy. Beautifully put. Yeah. Right? Like Beautifully I love put. a good analogy, right? And the taste of each one of those ingredients, the freshness of it is what's gonna make it, right? So each one of them, you get a bunch of old shitty food and you throw it together into a chili, you got a shitty chili. You have to have each one of them be, you know, be ideal. Um, we, uh, shawarma here, when you get shawarma, you get at least like a shawarma plate. They'll give you the shawarma meat, but they'll also give you these little flavored salads. They'll be the little salad made, made with peppers and tomatoes, and then there'll be like a sauce. But each of them are complex. Like each of them are in and of themselves this complicated little dish. You know, there'll be the chickpea salad, and then there'll be a couple of the vegetables over here, then the pickled uh, radishes, and then different kinds of spicy sauce. And it's like each of them now, each of them has a lot of ingredients. And all of those ingredients get blended to make this complex thing. And then next to it, and yet a fucking shawarma plate is so tasty, mm. so tasty. But there's so many little things that went into it. And not just like all the ingredients that made the one of the multiple little dishes on there, but the experience of doing that. Like if I just tried to make some chickpea salad, it'd be shitty. That chickpea salad took years of learning and, and, and tinkering until it was just right. And then we put it next to the pickled beets and that's some thing that your grandmother knew that thing and taught it to you. But next to them, each other, they're not quite right. So you pickle the beets slightly different and that's fucking everything. That's everything, mm. you know, it, it, people will give me a compliment. They'll be like, what, man, well, like, how come you're so good at breaking down fights? And it's like, because I'm always pretty sure that if I work really hard, I'll be way better in, in a few years. And that fundamental truth, that, fun, that fundamental constant tinkering, 
you know, and sometimes you tinker too far and you got to back off. You got to bring yourself back. Oh, I went too funny or too weird or too crazy or too technical or too whatever. Maybe we'll bring it back for a bit. But the journey out there taught you some things. And you're just continuing to learn all of these little things with the, with the key root knowledge being that if you continued to learn for another 10 or 20 years, if you looked back at today, would you think, I know next to nothing today? And the answer is yes. Mm. If I study martial arts for 30 more years and study language and poetry and timing and, and rhythm and, and texture and all of these analogy and, and um, you know, all of these things, cadence and millions of little aspects of within the martial arts themselves. If I did that for 30 years, would I look back at my breakdown today and think it's as written, as clunky and rickety as my first five when I look at them? And the answer is yes. So that means they're not that good in the context of what's possible. You know, it's nice when somebody compliments your work or says your podcast is great or man, I love that breakdown or whatever. But in the context of what's possible, it's really not that good. And in yeah. the context of what it is to be an expert in something, you're not an expert in anything. Nobody is because no. we know only a limited amount of what's possible to be known. Once you think of that, then you start being like, wait a second, why do I have such a strong opinion? Why would I argue politics? I don't know fucking anything about politics. I know about politics exactly as much as the news told me, which is nothing, right? In the grand scheme of the understanding of political science and history, I don't know shit. So yes. why on earth would I argue with somebody about politics? I see people arguing about fighting all the time. Never trained a day in fighting. They've never studied a real day in fighting. They would, they would parrot what a great broadcaster might have said or a fighter who does TV might have said, but they don't know anything about it, and yet they will fight with each other. Once we realize that we are all that naive, uh, we do a lot less arguing because we realize we don't know what we're talking about. And, but if we shut our faces for long enough uh, and keep learning, in 10 years we'll know more. I think... Um... For myself, I tried to simplify it for a lot of people with two kind of basic things, which are just attitude and application. Mm -hmm. So it's your attitude to deal with the failures and the successes, like not letting mm -hmm. it go to your head and mm -hmm. all the adversity that you're probably going to have to overcome. And then it's that application, that willingness to apply yourself to achieve what you want to achieve. So that goal set and not, yeah. and taking the risk, you know, like yeah. rather than, um, like what you said about the market and things like that. If you can't guarantee it, then I'm not going to do it. But it's like, no, your attitude and application is more likely what's going to make it a success rather than, for sure. you know, that breakdown of like, oh, well, if you can't guarantee it, so like, I'm not going to hold your hand through the process. You need to go do it. Yeah. And we also have to redefine what success is because if success for you is having done this, and let and I used to say this to friends all the time. Somebody would be like, um, how, "Let's let's use a selling coffee at a market, for example. How much is it going to cost for you to set up that booth at the market? What's well, two hundred dollars? How much are you going to spend on coffee and all those stuff? Well, it's another two hundred. Okay. If I could guarantee you that if you gave me four hundred dollars, you would learn more about your coffee business in one day than you would learn in any four months, would you give it to me? And they're like. Yeah, of course. It's like, good, then do it. Because you will learn more in, for $400, you will learn more about selling coffee at a market by doing it fucking Sunday than you will by doing anything else. So spend the 400 bucks and go to school, right? And uh, once you think of it that way, then if you sold $390 worth of coffee, you'd be like, fuck, I went to school for $10. I learned so much shit for only $10. Once you contextualize it that way, now you've changed what success is. What's success at, at my fucking coffee market today? Success is learning a shitload and getting better so that I'll be better at this in the future. Well, I can guarantee that if you go fucking do it, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, and then attitude and application, your attitude going in now is, I'm gonna learn everything that's possible to be known. You're also optimistic now and you're happy to be there. which will make you better at doing it. And application, you're there to learn, so you're gonna try different things. And that whole process will just start fucking working now, you know? But if you go there, like, thinking I have to be a success 
on Instagram or I have to, you know, my friend did the market and they made a thousand dollars. It's like, well, you're not on the same trip as your friend. Your mm. success will be learn something by doing this. And I will guarantee you if you do it, that you will be successful at that. Yeah, I think for each, and, and that's the other beautiful thing is when people understand each individual, it's going to be different. Your yeah. successful feeling, yours personally, and mine are completely different. In podcasting, I'll feel like I've been successful when I have Joe Rogan on my podcast, or yeah. he invites me on his. And until that yeah. happens, no yeah. success, right? But when that happens, yeah. if it happens, there'll be another fucking goal, you know what I mean, that I need to go and achieve and so forth. Of course. So, yeah, it's that of course. constant movement, you know? Yeah, constant of course. And, and understanding if somebody said to you, and that, that goal will change too, you know, that may stay the same, but there'll be another one that is as big or somehow different in what, what your, your path is. But if somebody said that if, to you, if you continue to your, your podcast as you are now, it's growing a little bit at a time, I can get, and, and you're, you're enjoying it, I can guarantee you in 11 years that will happen. You'd be fucking thrilled, mm. right? You already like it, right? All you'd have to do is keep doing the thing that you like and in six and a half years or five, you know, 42 months or 11 years, this will happen. But the truth is, if you do it for its own sake, it probably will anyways. Great things happen when you do them for their own sake. Uh, somebody, Sushil's 88 said, when will you commentate for the UFC? That's, an, that's a perfect example of this. I, my idea of exactly what you're saying, I will be successful when, was going to be when I sat down with John Anik, Robin, uh, Joe Rogan, and Robin Black, and we would commentate the UFC. That was my definition of it, right? Now, the issue, and, and a lot of things happened in the process. Joe Rogan, who I'd never met, uh, started to like and share my breakdowns. And he's an expert in this field. And he saw that, to him, his interpretation was that they were special. And so he, he sent me a message on Twitter once, um, a DM, just out of nowhere. Hey, man, and I was, think I was talking about a... Uh, Oh, God, I can't remember his name. He's a, a Chechen fighter who fights for KSW, um, Mamet Kaladov. And he's like, that Mamet Kaladov is something. And we chatted. I'm like, holy fuck, Joe Rogan's fucking sent me a DM. And we chatted. And then uh, I don't remember what year, but it's got to be about five years ago now, maybe even six. Um, on uh, August 3rd or 4th, I remember this for a reason. He was like, next time you're in L.A., let's do the podcast. And I was looking, I'm like, fuck, I'm going to be there at least once in the next, you know, two months. I've got a couple of things I'm doing. So I just said, I could be there because I could do a thing and do that and, you know, take care of a bunch of stuff. August 14th or to the, to the 17th, I'm going to be there or August 23rd to the whatever. And then August 10th, I remember that because August 10th is my birthday. On my birthday, there's a DM. He goes, yeah, man, let's do it. If you're in town August 14th, we'll do it. I'm like, holy fuck. And now we're friends, friends. Like we, you know, I saw him when we were just in LA and we text and like, he's my friend. Um, it's, it's different because we are like truly friends, but it's also like your friend is rich and famous and influential. So you, you treat that differently in certain ways, not in any way that you're humans, but in the way like, mm. I probably don't want to text him too much uh, because he's probably got a hundred billion things going on. Cause he's like man, Oprah. Or, you know, oh, I should, I should, I think Joe will find this interesting. I don't know if I should bug him right now. So you do get a little of that. That's a truthful element to it. Or people will be like, you know, hey, can you send Joe Rogan? This is like, I better not because I probably will only talk to him four times this year. And I better not send him that one funny video, you know. But so there's little bits and pieces that are different th than most friends. But otherwise, the way you just chat and hang out, he's still just a person, right? But so he invites me on, that goes really well. And like six months later, something's happening at my job and I ask him for advice. And he says, I'll recommend you to, to Dana, dude, you should be working for us. So all of a sudden that's like that golden ticket. A year earlier, I was just a guy working really hard doing good work. And now six months later, I'm on his podcast, we've become friends and six months after that, I'm in Dana White's office, acting out, fucking standing up, acting out stuff with him and his vice president. And at the end of the conversation, he says, well, you know, you're going to have a, we're going to move you and your wife to LA. 
you're going to do um, UFC. Uh, we'll forget what the show is called. US, UFC tonight, every Monday. And you're going to do our pre and post shows. You're going to do your breakdowns. Welcome aboard. You'll have a contract from us in four days. Um, take him in to meet Lorenzo. Meet Lorenzo. Welcome aboard. The whole thing. And that was five years ago. I still don't have the contract. Um, <laughs> because that this is exactly the thing. Because the realities of these things, he intended that that day. So did the vice president. They had a plan. The plan changed because it's complicated, but business is complicated. Because the broadcast partner was supposed to pay my salary. Something changed there with the boss there that really liked me literally in those four days. And you go on on hold and just do small little jobs for them. Those small little jobs never materialized into that. And I just kept hammering, kept hammering. I was driving myself crazy, right? It's like, I'm doing better and better and better work and more and more and, and 10 breakdowns a week and nobody's doing the work and I'm just hammering away at it because my intent was John Anik, Joe Rogan and Robin Black commentating the UFC and, and I wasn't going to be successful until that happened. Well, I hammer away at it till it drives me crazy. I now don't like some of the people in their company because I'm working so hard and I believe in what I'm doing and the structure is slow and they bring people along really slowly and you don't get the chances to do the things you believe you can do. And eventually I'm just like, fuck this. But because of that experience, as painful and challenging and stressful, mentally stressful as it was, where you literally are shaking hands with the bosses as they say, welcome aboard, and four years later, some middle executives are not getting you to do work, I eventually just soured on it, which allowed me to start moving over and covering Bellator. Then I started to see these athletes, and then I started to see this company. Then I started to realize that because they're smaller and more open-minded and younger, younger, they are more interested in innovating. And all of a sudden, I meet all these really talented, creative people. I see these young fighters that I didn't realize are as good or better than maybe the, maybe the others. I get brought into a place that's very much about empathy and positivity and all the things I'm into. And I get encouraged by the whole team, do your thing, innovate, do it your way, don't change anything. In the process of the other executives, they were like, bro, have you thought about like taking voice coaching, you know, because then you'd sound more like this. And that's more of what a UFC commentator sounds like, you know, that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, because I went through that frustrating path, I ended up where I should be. I'm exactly where I should be. This company is bigger than it was years ago. The other one is even more mainstream than it was years ago, more structured, more formulaic. They're younger and cooler. They're much more that Canadian vibe, like me, laid back, and everybody's like a team. And this one's a lot more corporate. Um, this one, they encourage me. And, and all of the things that I developed by being not jammed up in a giant corporate structure, it allowed me to experiment, try new things, try and fail, try crazy things, Khabib versus Bear, Kardashians fighting, whatever. These are things you can do on your own now because you don't have a big corporate master. And because of all that path, now finally I'm exactly where I should be. I'm exactly where I should be with a bunch of like-minded people, with young, hungry fighters in a growing company that knows it's gonna get bigger, has doubled in its, in its reach, in social media and everywhere and before I came in and I'm exactly where I should be. I still cover the UFC for, for a broadcast partner in Canada and I love it. I still love it. Like it lets me do just enough to be in those key fights and be involved in that stuff. But I ended up exactly where I should be, but it was years of frustration and it was years of, you know, one day you're, you think you're going literally, you're moving to LA and then day seven and day eight. And now you haven't heard from them. And they're like, Oh, sorry, something changed. We'll try this. And years later, you're like, what the fuck am I doing here? I thought, I thought this whole thing was, was a done deal four years ago. And, but that I'm now so thankful for that because it led me to literally exactly where I should be. The perfect <coughs> fit for me where I can contribute something back that's of value to them. I can grow as they grow and continue to grow. The people are wonderful. They're, they're about positivity and about innovation and about celebrating these fighters and I'm exactly where I should be. But to get here, the only route here was through there because I had set this very specific goal. And when you set that, you don't know what it really means. 
Mm. I didn't know what the, how corporate the UFC was. When logically, of course, the bigger a company is, the more structured they have to be, the more you know, executive in, infrastructures, layers of bullshit you have to deal with, the, the, the less creativity you'll have as there's much more formulas to be followed. I didn't understand that. I had to get, be part of that route to see that which led me to where I should be. But then, but that's the path, right? The path is setback, curveball, failure, try small victory, um, um, lateral move, reroute, different route up a mountain, almost get to the top and realize it's blocked, have to go all the way back down and look around to the other side for a different path. This is life. And once you see it, that it's, it's I wish I knew that 20 years ago or when I was a teenager. But it's impossible to know without seeing it for yourself. And now I do know. Now I know. Now that's part of it. Now, you know, that idea that I can will something to happen. Oh, me, Joe, and John Anik will be sitting there. We'll be calling it. Uh, uh, John is so structured. And Joe will, will you know, uh, uh, color outside the lines. And I'll add poetry. And it'll be brilliant. You know, at the time, too, one, one big turning point for me was, you know, two years later, I'm like, you know, this is nothing what I was told it was going to be, even in the slightest. And now they're doing um, Dana White's Contender Series. And I'm like, this is the job I should have. It's, it's newer. The fighters are newer. It's a little looser. It'll have a different structure. This is what I should be commentating. They, and it was a long process through there. And ultimately, I didn't end up. And that was the one where I'm just like, if they don't see that I'm the right fit for that, I gotta fuck, this, this thing has to just, I gotta get off this path. I gotta get off this path and find a different route up to a, to a spot on the mountain that I'll be much happier. And that's what I did. It's just gonna say, uh, drawn from the mind said my two favorite followers. <laughs> I was just, you know, he's cool. He's done some artwork for me. So if anyone ever wants cartoon artwork or styles, check him out. Um, <clears throat> I just had a question for you anyways, as well on uh, your thoughts on, Khabib and Ferguson and any hope for McGregor because the situation is kind of all up in the air at the moment with that, I assume, and whether you know anything or uh, um, following more than I am. Well, the, the big thing for me that I realized is that we're, we're fucking way off track when we're thinking about Khabib. It's like he's the greatest ever. He's the best in the world at something. And if somebody said to Beyonce, you work, we are a big company and we're putting on concerts and you have to fly to some other country and some other place. You can't train. You probably won't be able to, to work with your, um, with your voice coach because there's a fucking global pandemic and you'll have to be in a place with 40 in some other country with 40 or 50 or 70 crew and staff and, and lighting people. Even though somebody said uh, you shouldn't have gatherings of even five to 10 people, everybody else has to stay home, but you got to do all that. You're like, I'm the best in the world. One, Khabib. Two, uh, I don't need your money. Khabib's created a world for himself where he doesn't need money. He doesn't need love. He doesn't need, you know, um, he doesn't need admiration. He just needs to compete and live his life and inspire the people he inspires. And he's like, ultimately, you're like, no, <laughs> sorry. The rest of the world is shut down and uh, we should be too. And I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. And um, we can get as mad as we want, but he also created a world where he doesn't have to care what we think either. He's got 20 million Instagram followers. I'm sure 8 million of them love him no matter what he does. He can put on a grappling or a training session in his gym in Dagestan with some of the best athletes in the world and film it on iPhones and get it and scratch the itch that way. He doesn't have to do this. So he's not doing it. And I think that's great. I think, I think we should be, um, look at that as a lesson, life lesson. Can you create a, and a reality for yourself where you're not incumbent. You're not like, you're not, can, you, you, nobody can control you, not a corporation, not a boss, not an audience. You do what's best for you. And that's why he's the best in the world. And so I'm for him. I'd like to see the fight. I can love to see the fight. Yeah, but, too. You know, you can't force Khabib to fight. So that's off. You can't force, you can't, it's not like there isn't like a fucking insane circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. Like every one of us is trapped in our home. You know, we got groceries, we put on rubber gloves and I'm not afraid of being sick, but I don't want to pass it to anybody. 
I don't want to like harm older people in my neighborhood, put on gloves, cover it up, got groceries and went home. And you want this guy to somehow fucking train to fight and travel on planes all over? Fuck you. No, I'm not doing it. And so good on him. And good on him, you know. Uh, now, on the other hand, I would love Tony Ferguson. Maybe Tony Ferguson's the best fighter in the world. Sure, it fucking looks like he could be. Could be the best ever. Uh, and this would be the fight to prove it uh, for him. But sad, and I wish he could because I'm a big fan of his and I fucking like to see it. But uh, unfortunately, Khabib didn't create these circumstances. Neither did we. The, the, it's a fucking global pandemic. If anybody wants to call Khabib, who people, again, who know literally nothing about training to fight in a cage against the best fighters in the world, want to be mad at him, let them. Uh, there's bizarre circumstances, so everything is shut down, including Khabib fighting Tony. So we just accept it. We have to accept it and figure out how to live within it, and hopefully they fight in six months, uh, and maybe they'll never fight. and It'll just be that one. There's always... Every generation has one of those, you know, one of those yeah. fights that just never fucking happens. Maybe this is that. What are the odds, you know? What are the yeah, odds, yeah. though, of all the times this yeah. fucking buckle? I know. Yeah. <laughs> this man. Yeah. Do you know? think um, McGregor steps in? I mean, there's reports yeah. of Justin Gaethje. I think probably, I think probably Gaethje. Uh, but then Tony might not do it. Like, Tony might be just like, you know what? It depends. They're in different circumstances. Like, if Khabib made $10 million or $7 million, it sounds like, he, and he has support from the Prince of Bahrain. I was in Bahrain, and I saw Khabib sitting with the Prince of Bahrain and the president of Chechnya. And these people are like sponsors, too, and have been at different times. The guy doesn't need money. He's not even motivated by money. So that's out. Tony's, you know, a Westerner with I'm going to probably, I'm going to say 2 million Instagram followers. Not that that's the be all end all metric, but it is a, I'm checking out quick. It is a meaningful metric from a business standpoint. Tony Ferguson. Tony has, yeah, 2 million, 1.9 million. Khabib has 19.9 million. So he has 10 times like, you know, a thousand percent, um, the, uh, the influence, um, Tony's probably good too. Tony's a martial artist. He's a character and an actor, or sorry, an um, artist is the word I was looking for, and a combat um, professional. Um, I hope he's made money, but I hope he's made enough money that he doesn't need to be so heavily driven by money either. But he's had a lot of unfair situations considering how special he is as an athlete and a martial artist. Mm. So he might. So in a situation like that where he's like, you want me to fight Justin Gaethje? Fine, I want three million. And they come back and they say, how about two? And you're like, fucking two million can make a big difference to my family. So if he's in that, cir that circumstance, you might see it. If he's not, I don't know that you will. Uh, because it's like, I'm, I'm fighting Khabib for a title. They could come out and say, oh, how about an interim title? Uh, but he already won one of those and they stripped him of it. You yeah. know what I mean? So, so I don't know. He's got a bad taste in his mouth too. What I described about my path of working for that corporation and let me add like me and dana are cool like when i went to work for bellator and i was like hey dana i texted him we were texting a couple of days off and on and i was like you know i'm going to do this right now you know the the executives in your company it just hasn't worked out uh you know are you cool he goes go do it you know do your thing enjoy it and and let's chat in in, in a year and and maybe i'll have something for you and it's like cool but although right now i'm so fucking happy like i don't care who had something for me in a year i just i'm loving it so much and like everything it's everything i i, I was looking for you know the the, the encouragement freedom's the wrong word freedom is great but more than freedom is encouragement when people are like oh yeah that crazy idea of yours we definitely need to try that uh, what can we do to help you do that crazy idea? That's the kind of shit going on with Bellator. And then you see how good these young fighters are and stuff. But, but anyways, yeah, so Dana said that. And I will I'll chat with him in a year. Um, and I like him. I like how driven he is, uh, you know, for good or for bad. That's who he is. I, and that's inspiring in its own way. He's true to himself. No matter how many people are saying, dude, don't do this. You make people sick. He's like, this is what I do. I get shit done. So I get it. I get it. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, so in there, uh, Tony Ferguson has had that experience with that company as well. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how happy he is about it. Maybe we won't see the show at all, or maybe we will. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, if we chat, even if it's in a, a DM or whatever, 
in six or seven days, I think we'll have a better, we'll have a better idea. Or why don't we circle back in seven days and talk about this again? I do have a call. I'm, I have a, I'm doing stuff with Fail Army. You know the channel, Fail Army? Yeah. And uh, we have um, a Fail Army Robin Black breakdown coming out today. So I have to check in with them. But why don't we circle back right here in a week and do it again? And then we'll Sounds know good more to me, by brother. then. Right. Yeah, no, I'll be looking forward to that. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for talking to me, man. I really appreciate it, as always. You yeah, man, my, my pleasure. Yeah, you too. I'll Take talk care. To you soon. Okay, enjoy the hostilities, my friend. That was fun. It's always good catching up with a friend. And uh, yes, I have a, a call with Fail Army. And then in the next couple hours, if you go to at Fail Army, at Fail Army, uh, my new Robin Black Fail Army One Minute Breakdown will come out today. Oh, actually, at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 2 p.m. Pacific, I will be on Fail Army's uh, Instagram live stream. So uh, let's see you then. All right. Cheers. Much love.